I'm Mike Swetnam, and it's my privilege to welcome you to the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies. Uh, I think most of you in the room, uh, we know very well, you've been here many times, and uh, welcome back, and thank you very much for participating with us. For those of you who haven't been here before, the Potomac Institute is a not-for-profit that specializes in the issues of science and technology, and how science and technology drive policy, and in particular national security. And it has been our great privilege here at the Potomac Institute for um, um, much more than a decade, going on I think 14 years, to host uh, the International Center for Terrorism Studies here at the Potomac Institute, headed by Professor Yona Alexander. And the International Center has uh, sponsored and co-sponsored, actually most often with uh, with the International uh, Institute of Law and and uh, here at the Potomac Institute, a number of seminars on the issues surrounding terrorism, uh, uh, the use of technology by governments and organizations to threaten mankind, and more, more recently, a series of seminars addressing Iran and Iran's nuclear power. And Yon is going to mention uh, the uh, potential for a large study here at the Institute that, uh, that raises the issue of a nuclear free zone, if you will, in the Middle East, a very intriguing concept that I'm sure Yona will talk about. These seminars are all designed to contribute to the academic discussion of policy surrounding the threats that are arising in the Middle East. At a, as we conclude the, a decade focused on terrorism and start a new decade, which began with the what was being called around the world as the Arab Spring, uh, many of us seem to have forgotten an age when the international global existential issues were about uh, nuclear things that threaten everybody instantly in, in, instead of uh, riots and, and uh, social unrest in cities, uh, a time when we all felt threatened by instant and maybe global annihilation, annihilation because of nuclear power in the United States and the former Soviet Union. Uh, today, many might say that we're less safe than we were then because of the spread of nuclear weapons. And of course, the most recent proliferation issue is Iran. Yona needs to be credited once again for being the creator of the most intriguing uh, titles of any seminar series you'll find in Washington, D.C. Titling this one, A Final Warning to Iran, might be something that we could put on two or three more of these seminars over the next couple of years. <laughs> but let's hope that this isn't a final warning and that they demonstrate nuclear power this afternoon. But w with that, uh, it's important to note that the policy issues surrounding this, this, uh, this issue are deep and profound and not at all easy. Your input, your scholarship, your discussion of these issues with the panel that we've put together today will greatly contribute to our study of the issue and hopefully to the body of knowledge that helps inform our policymakers. So I greatly thank you for coming and encourage your participation and your questions when you address, uh, when the panel addresses you here in a little bit. Uh, and I want to, before I turn it over to Yona, I cannot fail to mention uh, and, and welcome several members of the Potomac Institute Board of Regents who have uh, joined us today, uh, starting with Yona Alexander, who is one of the original members of our Board of Regents, uh, Professor Alan Mogisi, back in the corner, Ambassador Dave Smith, and the Honorable Don Kerr. Thank you very much for coming, and uh, uh, please guide us as we go through the discussion. Yona, would you like to take the stage? I appreciate uh, your kind words. Uh, <clears throat> despite the final warning, uh, I hope that uh, <clears throat> the audience uh, will relax um, and uh, continue to uh, eat uh, the gourmet food that we have. And um, it's a working uh, luncheon, so there is no, no problem. Uh, we'll have a discussion, but before we do, uh, again, I would like to welcome uh, the audience, uh, we, we have many people here who have participated in our work for uh, many, many years, and they're continuing to work 
uh, with us. Uh, I would like to, to thank uh, Lori Kinney right here for recording uh, this uh, event. Uh, also, we have a group of uh, the future, what we call the future generation of scholars and professionals, our uh, interns. Uh, <clears throat> Evan, would you introduce uh, yourself and a few of the interns who are right here? Uh, of course. Uh, my name is Evan Lund. I'm a research assistant here at UCLA. Uh, here's Amy Glazier. Okay. I'm a research Well, I'm sure that this uh, group probably uh, will meet again in five or ten years, uh, right there at the Potomac, to talk about the final uh, warning to drive. <laughs> well, um, maybe we shouldn't be so pessimistic, but at any rate, uh, welcome to uh, our, our session. Before I introduce our very distinguished uh, panel, all of them are here, and we're very uh, grateful. Uh, as you know, the, the focus, uh, basically, of this uh, event <coughs> is Iran's uh, challenge to the uh, international community, and uh, particularly to deal with the nuclear ambition issue, but there are some other issues that I'm going to discuss a little bit later on. But very briefly, uh, the key question is that in light of the expanding uh, diplomatic and uh, economic uh, sanctions of pressure on Iran, the bottom line is uh, will Iran change its behavior? And uh, those who are optimists uh, believe that it might relinquish its uh, nuclear uh, ambitions or weapons of mass destruction uh, before the so-called doomsday uh, scenario occurs. <coughs> Now, uh, just two quick uh, footnotes before I introduce our, our panel. Uh, one, one is an historical um, footnote. Uh, back in 1968, when I visited Iran for the first time, over 40 years ago, uh, we, we had a session, not so many people, closed meeting, and we're talking about the aspiring nations in the Middle East, those who might be interested in developing nuclear capability. And obviously at the time was the Shah regime, and as we know what, what happened. Now, what is ironic <coughs> that uh, Iran under the Shah <coughs> combated terrorism, I'd like to mention one particular publication, the journal, the first issue of the journal on terrorism that we published in 1977. And uh, Ambassador Veda of Iran at that time at the United Nations, he prepared a, an article about the need to uh, mobilize international cooperation to fight terrorism. And now we know what happened. The, all the way back, from the attack on the U.S. Embassy, just last week the attack on the U.K. Embassy, and here we go again. Now, the academic work uh, that Mike uh, mentioned uh, goes all the way back, uh, actually, the concern that we had about the proliferation issue around the world. And fortunately uh, for us, with Professor Edward Teller, who was the chairman of our work for many, many years, and he became increasingly concerned about the threat to civilization, whether civilization will survive. So I'm not going to go into some, some of our studies. Uh, Mike uh, mentioned uh, one in terms of uh, our work related to the Middle East, weapons and mass destruction, free zone, and um, Probably we're going to discuss that kind of option that might be available to Iran if Iran wishes to cooperate and become a respected member of the international community. So I'm not going to go into that now. 
just one less footnote. Uh, clearly, Iran in our discussion <coughs> today is only one of the numerous challenges facing the international community. Mike already mentioned uh, the Arab Spring. In other words, the certainty about the uncertainty, whether it is uh, the Arab Spring or whether it is the future of, uh, of Iraq or the Palestinian-Israeli uh, issue, economic uh, crisis, the crisis of uh, leadership, identity, the energy security, etc., etc. Uh, and obviously, there is a very long list of uh, challenges facing the international community. Now, in regard to Iran, although we're going to focus on the nuclear ambition, there is no way that we can discuss the whole issue of Iran without mentioning something about the Iranian threat in terms of uh, terrorism. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the military uh, aspect that drone incident that happened, uh, the question of diplomacy, the question of sanctions, and most importantly, I think something new that the international community is becoming aware of, the so-called clandestine or secret war directed against Iran. Probably the Iranians are active for that. <laughs> I knew it. Anyway, uh, our first, uh, we have a very distinguished uh, team right here. I just am going to mention the, the group um, here in that order. The first speaker is going to be Leonard <coughs> Sandy Spector, currently the executive director of the Washington office of the Center for Proliferation, Non-Proliferation uh, Studies, Monterey Institute of International Studies. Next to him is Dr. Christopher Ford, who is currently the Senior Fellow and Director of the Center of Technology and Global Security at the Hudson Institute. Next to him <coughs> is Mike Eisenstadt, who is currently Director of the Military and Security Studies <coughs> Program of the Washington Institute for Nearest Policy. Next to him is Guy Roberts, the former Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Weapons of Mass Destruction Policy and Director of the Nuclear Policy Emerging Security Challenges Division of NATO. And next to him is our friend and colleague, <coughs> Professor Don Wallace, who is the Chairman of the International Law Institute. I'm not going to go into details to describe the many uh, extraordinary contributions of the panel. It is really amazing, uh, both as participants and observers. Uh, it's an excellent team. I would like to invite them to share their views about the nature of the threat and what can be done to reduce the risk. So again, our first panelist is uh, Sandy Spector. By the way, each one will speak for about 10, 10 minutes, and then we'll have enough time to develop the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Yona, for the uh, kind introduction, and thank you, Potomac Institute, for uh, having this panel. It's certainly topical. In fact, as I was putting the finishing touches on my remarks, my wife emailed me to say, my wife emailed me to say I should listen to uh, Diane Rehm because uh, she was having a panel on this very topic with colleagues that I had been with recently at another conference, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of us are ruminating on what's developing, and fortunately, enough occurs every week that we always have something new to uh, comment on. Uh, let me try to make four points in my uh, comments. I'll do it in an abbreviated fashion, and then I, maybe we can expand on some of them in the question and answers. Uh, the first point is we are up against a real timeline uh, of one to three years. People will differ as to exactly when a crucial threshold will be crossed. But in my own view, it's when about six weapons worth of material and the expectation that the Iranians know how to make warheads from it uh, 
is, is available or almost available. That is to say, uh, uranium, which could be rapidly upgraded to weapons grade uh, and then uh, placed into weapons, uh, that would be, for me, the moment of uh, crisis, uh, even if the actual act had not yet occurred because of the notion that if there were ever a crisis in which Iran were threatened, it would occur, and it would change the dynamics from that point forward. Um, the, uh, as we know from the recent uh, revelations at the IAEA, many aspects of weapons design uh, and manufacture have already been examined by Iran and may well have been mastered in some cases. We don't quite know what is left to be done. That's point one. Point two is, uh, as energetic as they are, current measures to stop the program are not working. And they are very energetic. Uh, the, uh, they run the gamut from uh, uh, export controls to covert action, and I'll just mention some of the intermediate points as well. Uh, one way to sort of differentiate the different clusters of activities is to think of one set as attempting to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons, and another set as trying to pressure Iran uh, to give up the effort. And I owe this uh, dichotomy to uh, Ord Kitri, a colleague I've worked with, a uh, professor at Arizona State University, but it's pretty elegant and it works rather nicely with uh, all of the different things that are in play. So in the preventing side, we have the export controls, including a, an embargo on, on keystone commodities, such as marriaging steel and uh, uh, carbon fiber, I think, which is now being pretty actively applied, <coughs> deterrence through enforcement, interdiction and interference with shipping capabilities, anti-proliferation financing, financing measures, targeted sanctions on nuclear entities and individuals, um, and maybe um, covert operations that are aimed specifically at the nuclear program, which I'll come back to. And then efforts to pressure Iran to give up the effort are the UN and US sanctions, uh, especially arms embargo. The, I mean, it's a whole, it's a, an across the board arms embargo, which is now being applied, both imports and exports to Iran, uh, as well as in the US case, a pretty effective effort to prevent uh, refined oil products from getting to Iran. Uh, and also, uh, currently, the denial of many Iranian banks, denial of access to the West, Western banking system. But if we have a timeline we're up against, and all of these measures, when combined, as important as they are, are not quite doing the job, and I wanted to just uh, point out one piece of evidence that they're not doing the job. This is the, um, the graph of the increase in 3.5 percent enriched uranium. You won't be able to see the numbers, but it's not the numbers that matter, it's the slope. <laughs> Uh, I think we all get that picture. And this is the slope of the 20% uh, enriched uranium. There's about four bombs worth of low enriched uranium if it were further upgraded, and I think less than a bomb's worth of 20%. Uh, so we still have time, but at a certain stage, the stockpile will exist, these other capabilities will exist, and we'll have a very, very difficult challenge in front of us. Uh, so point number three, I think you're driven to the view that we need to escalate in some fashion. And uh, here I would say, let's look at the sort of pressure on Iran that could be applied that isn't yet being applied. Uh, I think two major uh, areas are being discussed. One is applying sanctions to the Central Bank of Iran. Uh, it's been designated by the United States as a primary uh, money laundering concern. So steps are in train to do this. We know that the European Union and Great Britain, others are considering uh, this. Uh, a second major escalation of the pressures would be the curtailing the importation of Iranian crude, especially to China, India, and some of the other customers, Japan, South Korea. Uh, Bob Einhorn, as some of you read in the paper today, is in South Korea trying to persuade the uh, South Koreans to curtail or cut back on their purchases. And if what we're seeing in Syria, where a partial cutback can have a big impact, that is a partial cutback on purchase of the country's oil, uh, maybe uh, even a partial uh, diminution in what is available, what is being purchased from uh, from Iran would do the job, or at least in terms of increasing pressure significantly, even if China and perhaps India continue their purchases. Uh, the other thing that's occurring in the pressure zone is that the, the, the scope and the range and the reach of sanctions has been growing steadily. Uh, and indeed, it's become so broad in terms of the Iranian institutions and the impact on the Iranian economy and so the sanctions have been so varied in their justification that it seems like the goal here is not simply to curtail the nuclear program, but really to weaken the regime more broadly. And if you see recent testimony by Wendy Sherman 
or uh, at the State Department or David uh, Cohn at the Treasury, it's very clear they've got a list of things they're after. It's uh, stopping terrorism, uh, improve, improving human rights in Iran, the nuclear program. The nuclear program is the leading edge. It's the wedge. It's where things get started. But the sanctions are working on a much broader scale. And as I say, I think the, the goal here is uh, broader than just nuclear. And even if the uh, nuclear issue were somehow settled, uh, many of these sanctions would continue, especially the ones imposed by the United States, some of which include the most powerful ones on, uh, on the oil area and uh, banking. What about prevention? Well, there is this military intervention uh, topic that one hears about. Uh, I'd say it's a little bit like some bizarre subatomic particle in that it's in two places at the same time. <coughs> it's on the table and it's off the table. And it depends who's talking and what the context is. Uh, it's on the table from the presidential level, uh, clearly, that it is a possibility we have not ruled out and might employ someday. But it's off the table, at least for the current week, by virtue of uh, comments made by uh, Secretary of Defense Panetta uh, last week and others. There is a sense that uh, military intervention at this stage would be you know, a grave mistake and have very wide consequences. Uh, and that's in the form of an airstrike by Israel or, or something similar. Uh, but what hasn't really been discussed is the other prevention tool, which is getting more attention, and that is the uh, clandestine operations. This is very much alive and maybe just as, quote, kinetic, unquote, as a bombing raid. Uh, there have been 18, as I learned on the Diane Rehm show this morning, there have been 18 unexplained explosions in Iran in the past year, uh, one of which uh, has been said to be a, an accident at an important uh, missile uh, manufacturing and storage site that uh, killed the head of the, um, near the town of Bitkanef, which killed the father of the Iranian uh, missile program, General Hassan Maghadam. Uh, there's been no confirmation as yet about a second explosion. This was reported in the London Sunday Times last Monday, uh, and it is the assertion that there was an explosion at Isfahan, at the uranium conversion plant. This is a choke point plant uh, where uranium is converted from uh, a powdered oxide form into the gaseous form <coughs> for enrichment and where it would be reconverted potentially into uranium metal for nuclear weapons. Uh, presumably, there's a good deal of uh, this intermediate product, uranium hexafluoride, before enrichment stored there, or maybe after enrichment. Uh, and um, we don't know how much of it may be left. And there's been no confirmation of the <coughs> event, except that FARS news agency said there was an explosion. And then the comment was removed from the uh, news site soon thereafter. <laughs> it was said to be an accident like the Iranians said the explosion at the missile site was an accident. Um, so I think just to look at Panetta's comments, uh, presumably the United States is aware of these, this style of activity and also of the assassination of certain leading um, uh, uh, Iranian uh, scientists. And those just don't get commented on because they're secret. But it seems like that door is left open. Uh, even if it might reach the stage, I mean, if we start finding accidental explosions at enough nuclear sites, it would have the same impact, potentially, as an airstrike. And it might lead to the same kind of retaliation, uh, even if the perpetrator was not 100% known. Uh, but I think what Panetta was saying, in effect, and what the US policy seems to be, is that uh, overt prevention would inevitably and certainly have retaliatory consequences. We don't want that now. Uh, covert is less risky, it's dangerous, but we're prepared to tolerate the threat. And uh, I think that's where the, the, the game is being played at the moment. My fourth comment, Operation Arab Spring. <laughs> One additional reason why it may be that Washington is prepared to tolerate more pressure but wants to hold off on the overt attack uh, are developments in Syria. We will now have, it looks like within the next six months, two dictators deposed in part by outside pressure, in part with the support of the Arab League, um, and undoubtedly with a lot of covert support from the United States and others behind the scenes. Uh, if Assad falls, Iran loses its last uh, state, nation state ally in the region. Uh, and this would not only neutralize, uh, to a fair extent, or at least a partial extent, any Iranian effort to foment a wider war in the region, which everyone would be so nervous about. But I think it also would force Iran to focus its energies on what will certainly be a growing domestic challenge uh, to its survival. Uh, that will take strength from the Syrian case. Uh, 
I mean, there's a lot of enormous personal courage being demonstrated in Syria. And we may see the same kind of uh, readiness to suffer casualties uh, in Iran, which for the moment, uh, I think the, the public out, outbursts are being, uh, being suppressed. Uh, so I have a feeling if you sort of look at the, the very high level of what's going on, we have the uh, diplomatic pressure, which is increasing through the sanctions that I described. I think there is certainly an, an uptick in the uh, covert activities, maybe not precisely the uh, Isfahan case, but others are certainly occurring. And um, I think we have the larger regional context, which also is kind of tightening the noose against Iran. So uh, anyhow, that's how I am seeing things at the moment. And uh, the afternoon is still young, so there may be changes before we're done. Right. <laughs> well, thank you very much, and good afternoon. And uh, thanks to the Potomac Institute for having us all here today. Um, one could, of course, talk about Iran all day, and sometimes it feels as if I have. Uh, rather than just recapitulate what, what I've said elsewhere, though, I thought it would be sort of interesting, and, and, and in light of Sandy's comments, very, very appropriate, to say a few words about a topic that uh, for the past few weeks has been kind of uh, lurking just outside our field of view, kind of fuzzy in the corner, but always there somehow. And that is indeed this topic of, of possible clandestine war, of, of sabotage, and largely deniable, uh, but perhaps in some ways clear enough. Uh, violence against Iran and its nuclear weapons program. Uh, this is a topic, of course, that people in government are utterly unable to talk about publicly, uh, and for very good reasons, uh, except to issue the kinds of denials that one would expect them to make, whether or not those denials are actually true. Um, not being in government, uh, and us all being here to talk today, I thought it would be sort of useful to, uh, to explore it a little bit. Um, and what I thought I'd try to do is explore, is a test of uh, maybe three sort of commonly made assertions about the topic of, of a covert campaign of this sort. Um, but I hear frequently when these issues come up in sort of day-to-day -day conversation around here, uh, around Washington, I should say, um, and, and test them a bit and see how they stand up. Um, clearly, you know, in light of all the mysterious explosions and scientists turning up dead on their way to work and that sort of thing, um, this is an important, important topic. Um, the, the first thing that I hear frequently, hear frequently alleged is this idea that, uh, idea number one, that is a covert, uh, covert war of this sort is unlawful. Uh, and I think in many cases what this usually means is that the speaker feels that such techniques are sort of you know, dirty or unethical or kind of squirm-inducing in some sense. Uh, but for, to focus specifically upon issues of legality, one way to look at this, um, at what you might call counter-proliferation covert action, is to remember that both the U.S. and Israel, whether you agree with their positions or not, clearly seem to feel that overt strikes uh, against Iran's nuclear weapons program remain an option that is on the table, even if it is perhaps highly undesirable. Uh, this, they, they don't really articulate it in these terms, but uh, I presume this entails a concomitant <coughs> belief in the legality of such strikes. It's, I mean, it's possible that they think these things are a perfectly valid option, even though they're highly un unlawful, but I think the more reasonable presupposition is that, they, that, that their position that this is an available option implies a belief in its legality. Um, both countries, in fact, have in the past used force to move against uh, an emerging nuclear weapons program in, uh, in a, a, essentially a rogue Middle Eastern regime. Israel's done it twice, of course, so with the Osirak reactor in Iraq and uh, with the Syrian reactor not so long ago. Um, the United States understood itself to be doing that in 2003 as well. Uh, we also, I should point out, came very close to airstrikes against North Korea in 1994. We were not uh, dissuaded from that by our fears about its potential illegality. We were dissuaded from that because we thought we struck a deal that would obviate the problem. That's an important distinction. Um, so <laughs> one can presumably read these decisions and, and policy positions that, that both the U.S. and Israel reserve today as implying that at least in certain circumstances, attacking a potentially emerging weapons of mass destruction program is in fact a legitimate uh, exercise of uh, presumably self-defense rights. Um, Lawyers, of course, will or argue over these things endlessly, but I, it's clear that the U.S. regards an overt strike as being what the lawyers in the State Department, when I was there, used to call legally available. Now, if this is so, it stands to reason that the lesser included uh, option of covertly doing more or less the same thing is presumably also a, uh, a legally available option. To put it in traditional legal terms, uh, once you cross the threshold of conceding use ad bello, that is, once you accept the legality of going, in some sense, to war and using force um, and breaking things in the first place, um, you, which anyone who reserves the military option necessarily does, um, then you essentially, you know, everything re resorts to just whether you can justify this in terms of use in bello, that is to say, the law with respect to the conduct 
of war. And here, I think, as with targeted killing techniques more generally, a case can indeed be made that covert sabotage or direct action uh, missions offer an acceptable military payoff, maybe not quite as high as actually shattering the tons into a million pieces with JDAMs from, B from a B-2, but uh, an acceptable military payoff at less of a potential humanitarian and, I should add, geopolitical um, cost um, than, uh, than overt conflict. I mean, if you can blow up an Al-Qaeda commander or a Hamas leader with a Hellfire missile from a Predator or a, uh, an Apache helicopter, if, if this can accomplish a mission with uh, less loss of innocent life than no more traditional kinetic means, such as artillery salvos or aerial bombs, um, then so too perhaps component sabotage, computer worms, mysterious predatory motorcyclists, and odd explosions at missile bases um, can be considered inappropriate and indeed um, law of war compliant and indeed optimal uh, approach to handling a, a threat uh, presented from a nuclear weapons program. These kinds of shadow war techniques may not necessarily actually work, naturally, but that's a policy complaint, not a legal one. So, is there a feasible use ad bello argument for the use of force here in the first place? Um, well, the Israeli case for preventative self-defense, I think, is, is certainly stronger than the U.S. one, though I don't think either one has a negligible case by any means. Uh, not for nothing um, do commentators frequently refer to Israel as facing existential challenges here. Uh, but the American case is far from negligible in its own right. And I should also point out that use ad bello does not require that all belligerents have the same degree of just cause or face the same degree of threat uh, in order to give them an appropriate reason to go to war. If one country has a legitimate reason to use force in self-defense, I do not believe the law of going to war precludes it having allies. Now, international lawyers <coughs> will, of course, uh, always argue about these kinds of things. Um, the most usual formulation of anticipatory self-defense comes from something which I'm sure you guys are all aware of, and that's the old Caroline case in the U.S. from the uh, the early 19th century. But the interesting thing about that case is though, although both parties, the U.S. And, and Great Britain at the time, agreed on the appropriate legal standard, they never did quite agree on how to fit their particular fact pattern, or indeed any particular fact pattern, to that legal standard. And indeed, interestingly, the British argued in that particular case for a, a somewhat more flexible interpretation which allowed some kind of action against, I think the phrasing had to do with uh, a man standing on grounds where you have no legal right ordinarily to reach him, but who has acquired a tool, a weapon, that is long enough to reach you. That's a very pregnant phrase, looking at this back from the 21st century. Now, one potential lesson of their disagreement, by the way, in that case to me, um, is that although there is general agreement upon applying the standard of anticipatory self-defense, there may indeed be room for flexibility in invoking it, particularly where a potential adversary is in the process of acquiring something that can have very dramatic effects over a very long distance in a very short time. Um, one does not necessarily have to wait, I suspect, uh, until the missiles are actually being uploaded and ready to to fire. Um, this is, these are arguments that we've had since the early 2000s uh, in the U.S., of course, with uh, the Bush administration's national security strategy, so they're not new, um, but it's, it's worth recapitulating that there are indeed, while there are many arguments about this, there are vigorous cases that have been made in favor of a much more flexible approach to anticipatory self-defense appropriate for the WMD age. Now, if U.S. officials are indeed contemplating, or perhaps indeed now engaging in a covert war against Iran, they probably have something else also in mind, at least I would suspect that they might. Um, an additional political or legal rationale for the use of force. Tehran is now believed not only to have encouraged and supported guerrillas who have attacked U.S. forces in Iraq and Afghanistan, but also to have maintained a connection to the Al-Qaeda terrorist network for years. Uh, there have been stories for quite some time now about second-tier leaders fleeing to Iran uh, from Afghanistan after we talked with the Taliban, um, where they were initially detained, but apparently were subsequently sent back to Pakistan to uh, uh, go back to the, their anti-American jihad. And indeed, last summer, quite interestingly, the Obama administration acknowledged an Iranian connection to al-Qaeda, with the Treasury Department announcing sanctions against an Iranian-based terrorist network that seems to have been serving as an al-Qaeda funding pipeline. According to Treasury officials, Iran has indeed had an explicit agreement with these particular terrorists to allow Iran to be used as a transit point for funneling money and personnel en route to, uh, to the main jihadist theater. Now, these kinds of conclusions appear very innocuous when they come up in the form of a Treasury sanctions memo, but if they are indeed the position of the U.S. government, they could have important implications. The United States feels itself already clearly to have ample legal authority to use force against al-Qaeda, as well as its affiliates and its supporters. This authority comes basically from the right of self-defense, but it also comes specifically from the U.S. Congress's AUMF, the Authorization for the Use of Military Force of September 18 of 2001, 
which authorized the president to use all necessary and appropriate force against those nations, organizations, or persons he determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist attacks that occurred in September 11, 2001, or harbored such organizations and persons <coughs> to help prevent future attacks, blah, 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 blah. I haven't heard the argument made publicly, but one suspects that it is indeed possible that if Iran envisions, uh, that, that Washington now envisions Iran's alleged support for al-Qaeda as constituting a distinct and complementary source of legal authority for a military option. Idea number two, a covert war would provoke a bloodbath. This is an idea that one sometimes, sometimes hears articulated quite clearly. Uh, a, a covert war against Iran, it is said, would be a grave <coughs> policy mistake. And it usually revolves around ideas that are, are very similar to those made against an overt attack. Iran, it is said, is a very accomplished sponsor of international terrorism and would be sure to respond in kind and to our disadvantage. And I would say that there's some truth to this, <laughs> no question. Iran certainly is capable of fighting a covert war. And indeed, such a battle space is one in which the playing field would be somewhat more level than if we went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Iranians in, uh, in more conventional, overt military ways. Um, so, so that's true, but I think the unwisdom argument makes its case too, or over makes its case, I should say. For one, Iran clearly, in some respect, has already been in a covert war against us for quite some time, indeed, arguably for decades, if you go back to Hezbollah's truck bomb in, uh, uh, in 1983, or the uh, uh, explosion of Kobar Towers in 1996, or supporting militants in Iraq and Afghanistan more recently. And rightly or wrongly, Iran appears now to assume it is already in a covert war, whether we're doing so or not, um, assumes it is already in a covert war with the United States, um, publicly attributing the death of the, uh, the recent death of a number of scientists to both Israel and the United States. To judge by Tehran's apparent willingness to engage in what the Obama administration itself says was a plot to assassinate the Saudi ambassador to the United States and bomb the Israeli embassy here in town, um, Iran does not seem to think that there is a, a covert war frontier that remains to be breached by its potential adversaries. For Tehran, the game is already on. Could they make things worse? Yes, absolutely. Uh, but under the circumstances, I think it's not hard to imagine the United States envisioning a covert campaign as being far preferable to the more dramatic option of, uh, of overt attack. Certainly better than the option of overt attack or the option, perhaps, of learning to live with a nuclear-armed Iran, whatever that means. Idea number three, just to finish up. I've also heard it argued that counter-proliferation covert action would be unlikely to stop Iran's forced march toward nuclear weapons capability. Now, that's probably true. Um, I don't think I would disagree that occasional mysterious explosions at an IRGC base or the periodic gruesome death of a nuclear scientist on his way in in the morning commute is likely to actually stop a well-developed and fairly advanced and sophisticated nuclear program such as that that Iran has been engaging in. But I think that argument to some degree misses the point for the immediate purpose of either of their strikes, frankly, or of a covert campaign of this sort, presumably not to achieve immediate or complete eternal cessation of the program, but instead to, to do more prosaic things, imposing delays, driving up costs, um, otherwise constraining program development, and that kind of thing. <clears throat> and policymakers presumably would need to approach such things, if indeed they do, with an idea of what they're going to do with any resulting delay. You, know, you need to have a follow-up. <coughs> this isn't just about kicking the can down the road. You want to have some idea of what you're going to do in that intervening period. And some of the pressures that aim at weakening the regime that uh, Sandy referred to um, may play into, into that. Um, but the, the basic point is that I think the, the objective is not, the idea is not vitiated solely by a conclusion that one can't simply stop the program dead in the water. And there's one final point I should make in this regard. Um, as I've argued repeatedly for some time, I think we make a mistake if we regard the Iranian nuclear crisis simply as an Iranian nuclear crisis. It is also, and I want to emphasize this because I come out of the, uh, the NPT world at the State Department, it is also a systemic crisis of the nonproliferation machine as a whole, which we very much need to, we need to, that regime to survive uh, into, the, into the future. And um, we needed to survive that regime's current apparent inability to enforce its own rules. If Washington is serious about nonproliferation and about trying to ensure that there is a regime in the future, we need to approach Iran not just as an Iranian specific question, but as one in which we are always aware and formulating policy with an eye to broader systemic implications. This could be important, I think from the perspective of analyzing the merits and demerits of a covert war. Washington might come to conclude, for instance, that it has a, an interest in protracted covert struggle against Iran, even if Tehran <coughs> succeeds in weaponization. Such a shadow war might play a role, of course, in helping contain and constrain Iran as part of a sort of coercive containment strategy, uh, of course, but it might also be felt to have value beyond Iran by demonstrating the price that, in a sense, by implication, any country may have to pay if it violates its NPT obligations by developing nuclear weapons. 
even if we fail to prevent an Iranian bomb, in other words, there might be felt good reason in Washington or perhaps in Jerusalem for a covert war against Iran and its nuclear weapons program for essentially the same reason that Voltaire saw behind the British decision to execute Admiral John Byng in 1757. Pour les autres. Future Western policymakers might conclude that we could best preserve and vindicate the non-proliferation regime by ensuring that the perceived meta-narrative of Iran is not one in which a plucky underdog defies the might of the superpower, but rather one of a foolish dictatorship that made the decision to trade short-term tactical success in weaponization for a long-term strategic failure. Isolation and contempt, unrelenting pressure, impoverishment, weakness, thwarted regional ambitions, coupled with escalating shadowy violence, endemic sabotage, and indeed regime change pressures. If this perspective were to prevail, one might imagine policymakers concluding that there would be a rationale for a covert campaign against Iran, whether or not it actually slows or stops the program, and even after weaponization. I can't speak for anybody in any capital of the world, but I, 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 I think that that kind of reasoning is not entirely beyond imagining and perhaps may already have been in some sense reached even today. Who knows? But um, that's my musing on uh, uh, merits and demerits of the easy arguments against a covert campaign. I'm not making an argument for it or even making a legal case to justify it, but I'm pointing out that these are not hard and fast, crisp and clear issues which are easily decided. They're ones in which there's a great deal more, I think, policy discretion available to leaders around the world um, than we, uh, we lawyers customarily feel comfortable allowing. But, uh, but there we are. Thanks. Yes, thanks. <coughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Um, four points, like some of the prior speakers. First point I wanted to um, discuss has to do with, um, you know, some of the discussion uh, was uh, about um, what are the implications uh, of, uh, of a nuclear run for the region. Um, and the first point I want to make when I you know, hear that question raised is point is to point out at least the, the fact at least as as I see it is that first of all proliferation is a process and not an event and it's a process that we are in the middle of already um, and I think one could point out um, in the last few years we've already seen many of Iran's neighbors as well as Iran itself already altering their policies adjusting to the possible emergence of Iran as um, a nuclear weapon state in the future. We've seen, for instance, um, all the GCC countries have, as well as uh, Turkey and um, Egypt, already <coughs> indicated their um, interest in um, exploring um, their civilian nuclear options, um, and they've already uh, announced that they're going to uh, set up the basis for a uh, civilian nuclear program, which I see, at least in certain cases, being part of a hedge strategy in the long run, um, in creating the foundation of what many people have talked about, about concerns related to a nuclear cascade in the region. Um, Iran is already in this situation where, if they so desired, they could transfer technology, nuclear, civilian nuclear technology, which is dual use, to like-minded states who want to have a nuclear program of their own. And this is the adverse side of the cascade uh, 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 fear is that Iran might, like many other prior proliferators, become a source of additional proliferation. And if you look at the history, most proliferators have helped, at least in the early years of their proliferation, in the youth of their proliferation, have helped like-minded states. I mean, you had uh, the French helping the Israelis, the Russians helped the Chinese, the Chinese helped the Pakistanis, the Pakistanis helped the North Koreans, the, the um, Iranians, the Libyans, and the North Koreans have helped the, the Syrians. So. Iran is already in a, in a situation where, if they desire to do so, they can help um, other countries. And I think it's quite possible in the long run we'll see an addition, we'll see uh, an additional one or two, uh, you know, countries benefiting from uh, Iranian nuclear technology, if not developing a nuclear weapon on their own as a result of this development. And then we're also seeing a, a growth in conventional arms sales in the region, a, a military buildup. Um, UAE has announced major arms purchases. Saudis have um, announced major arms purchases. And this is part, again, of a strategy um, among the countries in the region and the United States to create a less conducive security environment for Iran to kind of send the message that if you go down this route, your security situation will deteriorate, not improve. Likewise, I would argue that 
Iran's more assertive posture in, the, in, in recent years, I think is probably due to several factors related to the evolution of the political system in Iran, but also I think due to the anticipation that if they decide eventually to develop nuclear weapons, they will be able to do so and, and, and will succeed in doing so. And in a way, they're already kind of acting with the swagger of a country that sees um, you know, th this future open to it if they, if they desire to, to choose it. Now, in terms of Iran's strategy, I would say there's two parts to it. First is, obviously, to create the infrastructure required to build a bomb should they desire to do so. And let me just say, I often hear people say, but we have no indication they've taken the decision yet. And I would simply respond by asking, how would we know if they have? It, unless they try to operationalize it by actually moving forward to weaponize, a, a, a decision in principle, we would never know if in the mind of the Supreme Leader, you know, his intent is when, when, when an, a, an opportunity presents itself, they will build. How would we know that he, the decision hasn't been, been taken? So I, I would simply say we should avoid predictions about um, decisions of which we, ha we would have no ability, we would have no means to, to, de to detect. The second part of this strategy is to um, create this perception of inevitability regarding their nuclear goals, whatever they might be, while shrouding its program um, to the best that they can in ambiguity. Um, and there's several components of this. First of all, with inevitability, Ahmadinejad has said several times that the nuclear program, and let me just say, when he uses, when he talks about Iran's nuclear program, I, I, I believe this is kind of a, a double entendre for him. You know, he, it enables him to say, I'm simply talking about nuclear technology, so a peaceful nuclear technology, but those who have the worst fears about Iran's intentions will read into it, you know, nuclear, nuclear weapons. And he says, and he said this a number of times, the Iranian nuclear program has no brakes and no reverse gear. Um, and he, he said also during the summer, he said, Iran does not want to bomb, but if we were to decide to get it, the U.S. could not do a damn thing about it. And this actually is a play on uh, a, a very famous phrase by Ayatollah Khomeini about after, during the hostage crisis, America cannot do a damn thing. So it's crime, trying to create this image or in, uh, you know, perception of inevitability in terms of where they're going. In terms of the ambiguity component of their program, there's basically three elements of this. First of all, most obviously, um, their, their creation of dual-use facilities, um, um, Natanz, Fardo. Secondly, mixed messages and double entendres. As I just explained, you know, uh, Ahmadinejad's word, wordplay. The fact that he's, since 2006, has, has said repeatedly, Iran is a nuclear power. And again, I think he uses that ambiguous phrase intentionally exploiting the inherent ambiguity in the, in, in the term. Again, those who fear Iran's intentions read into it, you know, a, a, you know, darker, you know, darker, more sinister intentions than those who are more sympathetic to Iran's explanations of, of its intentions. And then finally, symbolic surrogates. They often use their missile program as a stand-in, um, in a way, for nuclear weapons when they, they have them on parade and they have the banner saying Israel should be wiped off the, off the uh, map. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure, you know, conventionally armed missiles are, are really provide that kind of uh, wherewithal, but, you know, if in the future the missiles have the nuclear tip, you know, uh, nuclear warheads, well, that, re you know, raises that as a potential option. And likewise, during the summer, they revealed this um, missile silo, um, which uh, had, uh, hardened uh, blast doors and, and the like, which again, I think, again, is, is intended to create the perception that this is, the, they're heading in the direction of nuclear weapons, even if they, they're not there now. Now, in terms of what are their options moving forward, I, I think um, Iran is pursuing a two-track policy with regard to their nuclear program. Let me just say, lest anybody guess, you know, uh, or, or wonder, you know, my belief is that they wouldn't have put the, um, invested the effort in this infrastructure and paid the price they're paying unless they intended eventually to develop uh, nuclear weapons. But uh, that eventually is, is a key word, and it, it, it's something which might not come uh, any time in the near term, although there's a caveat which I'll, I'll provide in a minute uh, on that point. So the two tracks are this. First, if they could build a clandestine facility or several clandestine facilities and secretly produce low and then high enriched uranium and then perhaps even build a bomb, I think they would do so. The question is, given the degree to which their program appears to be penetrated, <coughs> given the uh, amount of information in the IAE reports, this clandestine uh, covert action campaign, which obviously requires a, a high degree of knowledge about aspects of the program, at least, and the, and the, and the, the roles of certain scientists in their daily, their daily um, um, routine. Um, I'm not sure they feel they, they could do this at this point, but I think they would like to if they could. And, uh, and, and let me just say, um, if those intelligence assets which provide a degree of uh, um, 
insight into the program which allow a covert a action campaign or compromise. And apparently, and I, I'm just going based on what's in the media, uh, Hezbollah recently and, and Iran have recently um, discovered um, Iranian uh, CIA agents, they're claiming. Um, um, you know, these, these are very fragile assets which probably take years to uh, create and which could potentially be rolled back very quickly if they get lucky or, 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 or you know, whoever's doing it gets sloppy. The second track is that I think they will continue to stockpile low enriched uranium um, in the, for the foreseeable future at, at Natanz and, and, and at Fardo, um, and perhaps even for years to come. Um, and I think the reason why they would pursue this route, at least for now, is that from their point of view, they're accruing many of the benefits of nuclear um, weapons without many of the risks at this point. Um, so why not continue down that path? And also from their point of view, um, if 10, 15 years from now or five years from now, they have the equivalent of you know, enough LEU for 50 or 100 bombs, that in itself is a form of nuclear deterrence because they can always claim in the event of a crisis that under Article 10 of the NPT, they, you know, if, if the United States attacks them, they will withdraw from the NPT and they will weaponize uh, the uh, LEU. Well, they will further enrich it and then weaponize it. Um, and even if the US or Israel bombs it and destroys 70% of the stockpile, the 30% that rema remains won't, will be enough perhaps for 20 or 30 bombs, or you know, 15, 20 bombs, an arsenal. Um, and that in itself would be um, a, a form of uh, nuclear deterrence. And who would want to risk that possibility? So you have actually a nuclear, po uh, a nuclear deterrent policy without actually building nuclear weapons. Now, let me just say, I, I mentioned before um, that there was a ca caveat. And my, my concern is that if they feel that they are in a situation where they have nothing to lose from a breakout, we've put all the sanctions on them, and maybe we've you know, done things to prevent them from exporting oil. Um, and they don't believe that we would react to an attempt to break out with, uh, with, with bombing, then maybe they would abandon this five or 10 or 15 year plan and go down that route much sooner. So that I, I wanna just say, and maybe it's in response also to all these things that we've talked about, the sanctions and covert action and the like. So there's a danger that going down this route, which I think is desirable, we have to also be aware of the possibility that we not put them in a position where they have nothing to lose um, uh, by you know by weaponizing um, and, and, and and nothing to fear because they don't believe that we will use military force um, if, if they do so which leads me to my last point about US policy and what to do um, first the current administration's policy focused strictly on the diplomatic track after that didn't yield success they had a two-track policy of diplomacy and economic pressure most recently in uh, Secretary of Defense Panetta's speech over the last weekend, he added a third leg to our, our policy, which is strengthening security partnerships, basically by arms, arms transfers and, and, and mil, mil cooperation and the like. And I would argue that's a step forward, but it's, it's probably not enough. Um, and I would argue that the military instrument of national power has to play a larger role um, in our policy uh, towards Iran um, if we want to avoid actually outcome, outcomes that we're trying to avoid. And I think the alleged uh, terrorist attack in DC reveals, should be a wake up call for us in this regard, because I think it reveals that US deterrence is diminished. After 30 years of terrorist attack without a military response, my read is they've gotten to the point where they feel they could perhaps even sponsor acts on US soil without the fear of retaliation. And if that's the case, first of all, unless we change that assessment, they might try it again and they might succeed, in which case we find we're, we're practically we're at war, or, or, the, or, the, or the conflict that we've been engaged in for 20 years uh, is, you know, is, it has been escalated greatly. Or they might actually uh, believe that, well, if, you know, um, if the United States is not going to respond to these things, maybe they won't respond to an attempt at a breakout. And they get to the situation where, again, we sanction them, um, they can't export oil, and they feel from their point of view there's nothing to lose, and, and, and there's nothing to lose um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, we, we sanction them uh, across the board, and if they do try to break out, you know, we're not going to bomb them. So they have to believe that if they do try to break out and they tr do try to build a weapon, um, that we will bomb them. So the challenge is this, if we do nothing, we might get more terrorist attacks, in which case we might be, uh, the conflict um, might escalate dramatically. And if we do nothing, they might also feel that they could um, uh, we you know, perhaps uh, weaponize with the impunity eventually. If we overreact, and we are, are, are you know, um, uh, you know, don't calibrate this policy the right way. There's also the policy, of the possibility of miscalculation, and you know, Admiral Mullen talked about this. 
and his uh, desire to have a, a hotline with the, the Iranians to prevent this. So it's a, it's a very it's a very difficult balance that we need to strike. You know, it, but but I'm, I'm convinced we need to have the military instrument of national power has to pay, play a more robust role in our policy towards Iran simply because of this. If we sanction them across the board, again, it's, it, it'll, it backstops everything else. Because in the end, if they're sanctioned across the board and they feel they have nothing to lose in terms of there's nothing we could hit them worse with in the, in the economic domain, the knowledge that we could hit them with and that we're willing and ready, willing and able to do so in the military domain might be the only thing that prevents them from uh, breaking out um, and, 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 and going down that route. As to how to rebuild our credibility, that's, that's, a, that's a challenge. I've already gone over my time, I know. I don't really have the answer as a short of it, um, but I, I think we have to f find a way in order to um, uh, change the perception um, of the credibility of the threat. And part of it is changing the, the way that the administration looks at this. Um, and uh, perhaps this is something we could talk about in the Q&A, but I don't want to go any further at this point over my limit. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Yona, for being here, and thank you, uh, Tom again, too, for this opportunity. Good to Hello, good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, I'll try to be brief. Being the last speaker, of course, it's a little bit easy because everybody said everything I want to say already, and but then again, I'm a lawyer, so I'm here for another hour. So we'll that <laughs> <laughs> can, can you build this? Yes. Uh, <laughs> 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 what? what um, I want to follow up on what Mike said because I think I think there's um, I was. Uh, a few days ago, anybody watched the ACC championship game, and I was rooting for the Hokies. And uh, of course, uh, Clemson uh, ran all over them. But there was a, a great analogy there because what happened was uh, the Hokies have this incredible running back, David Wilson, a guy who ran for I think 1,500 yards in uh, ACC. And what Clemson did was they just put you know five guys on David Wilson, and every time uh, you know they got he got the ball, he was just wiped out. I think he gained a total of 20 yards in the whole game. And I thought that was a great analogy of what we ought to be doing uh, with Iran. Um, in fact, I call this uh, waging deterrence against Iran. Um, you know, there's, we've already talked a little bit about this, and, you know, there's a long history. In fact, I remember back in 1993, uh, this wonderful cartoon of, of uh, Boutrous Galleys uh, in the UN saying, you know, we should just have. Uh, the nuclear weapon states give up their nuclear weapons, and then there's a guy, the Iranian, raising hands and said, I'll take them. <laughs> um, and that was in 1993. And I mean, think, and since 1991, I also remember working the uh, cooperative, what became the Cooperative Threat Reduction effort with the Soviet Union, our former Soviet Union. And there were uh, many rumors and intelligence indicating that Iranians were offering up to $250 million for a nuclear weapon. Uh, and so we were very worried about Iran even back that far about a nuclear weapon program and doing those kinds of things. And of course, uh, for me, um, we are already at war with Iran. And when you look at what Iran has done, uh, certainly with their active campaign, certainly with their supporting Hezbollah uh, as their proxies to bomb Western targets, uh, they, the Revolutionary Guard, Cud Force, uh, has a very active campaign to kill Americans. Um, they have, uh, in fact, I think it's one of the most, the deadliest campaigns against Americans, terrorist campaigns in history. Uh, they are providing uh, explosive form penetrators capable of punching through the strongest armor uh, that are being used in Afghanistan against American troops. They have uh, exported sniper rifles that have been used by the Taliban to kill Americans. Uh, and the list just goes on and on and on. So I'm, I'm very comfortable with responding to uh, the Iranians, both covertly and overtly, in those kinds of activities. Um, the, um, the other side of this, too, is if you look at and back to this analogy, this football analogy, uh, you know, uh, back uh, over a decade ago, our, when uh, our good friend uh, Hugo Chavez came to power in Venezuela, uh, we were getting indications. In fact, one of the first things he did is he invited Iranian scientists to go work in the uh, 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 nuclear reactor that the U.S. very kindly, it was a research reactor we built for the Venezuelans in the 1970s. And they have Iranians working there now. Um, in fact, uh, the Iranians have a very active campaign in, uh, in South America. It's, I think it's gone under the radar, and I think it's something that needs to be focused on. They've signed over 70 joint venture deals with uh, Venezuela. 
uh, that has added up to over $17 billion in, in, uh, um, in contracts. Um, they have uh, been working well. Uh, Ahmedinejad has visited not only Chavez, but Bolivia's Evo Morales. Uh, he's also visited uh, Danny Ortega in Nicaragua. Um, and by the way, Bolivia has some of the largest uranium deposits in the world. Uh, and again, they've been looking at uh, uh, developing uh, those for export to Iran. Um, I thought it was interesting uh, that uh, uh, in Bolivia, uh, the President Morales had invited uh, uh, Defense Minister uh, Vahidi to visit uh, Bolivia, and of course he showed up there. And General Vahidi, actually there's an arrest warrant out for him in Argentina as uh, implicated in the 1994 bombing attack in the Jewish community, which killed, I think, 85 people. Uh, and this created a big diplomatic incident. Uh, Bolivia apologized for that, but nevertheless, uh, General Vahidi's response is that this was a Zionist conspiracy. Uh, and this is the kind of thing that I think the United States needs to be very actively countering and going after in a very proactive way to every time the Iranians engage in activities like this, engage in uh, outreach to other uh, countries in any shape, way, or form, we need to be very aggressive in pursuing uh, a strategy to stop them. Uh, likewise, uh, I don't believe uh, that uh, any threat, a use of force, particularly a bombing campaign, is very credible to the Iranians. Uh, they have done all these things, and what has the United States done? Nothing. Uh, yes, we can argue about uh, maybe some covert activities, whether you want to, and I, again, I have no independent knowledge of this, whether the Stuxnet virus uh, may have been, you know, an active campaign or any of these other activities, but I, I, I believe that the Iranians don't believe there's any cost to pursuing these very aggressive programs. And, it, and until we do, uh, until we show them that there's going to be a price to be paid, uh, then they're going to continue. Um, and likewise, uh, in my time at NATO, we were um, very active in, initially in trying to develop um, uh, programs with our um, uh, partners, and I want to speak a little bit about that because I think that's one of the things that we can do because this isn't just a United States uh, concern. Uh, the European Union and NATO have expressed a long time concern, as you know, the, the activities of the EU3 and then it was EU5 uh, plus 1 and, and it goes on and on and on of offering a series of incentives, a series of, of, of uh, benefits to giving up the program, which of course the Europeans are totally shocked when the Iranians uh, basically slapped the hand uh, of, uh, of these kinds of uh, uh, economic incentives to stop the program. Um, but one of the things that uh, I found interesting, and I made a trip uh, out to the Persian Gulf in, uh, last year, in which um, our uh, Istanbul Cooperation Initiative partners have uh, indicated that they would very much like to have a relationship with NATO uh, and have offered uh, a series of opportunities, whether it be exercises, whether it be training programs, whether actually being establishing an office there uh, with the idea that by creating these stronger ties with NATO, that would serve as a deterrent uh, with uh, Iranian hegemonic aspirations in, in the Gulf uh, region. Uh, and that's something that it, I think is worthwhile pursuing. Likewise, um, when you look at what the United States is doing, I think there's a plausible argument that the United States has already given up the idea that we could stop the Iranians from acquiring a nuclear weapon. And that, in fact, what we are doing is we're developing a containment policy in the Gulf by a buildup of conventional forces, by a buildup of naval forces, <coughs> uh, uh, stationing and uh, uh, status of forces agreements with a number of the countries in the Gulf region, uh, building forward operating bases. And when you look at those activities, uh, I think you can re reasonably conclude that that's exactly uh, what we've decided, is that we are not going to be able to stop. Uh, after all, deterrence in general has never been about a program. It's been about uh, a use or attempted use of a weapon system. So trying to, to stop um, uh, a program, especially all the way to the point where it's uh, uh, not actually got a nuclear weapon, is exceeding, exceedingly difficult. The second aspect of that is, again, this fear of a cascade, a fear that Saudi Arabia, Egypt, other countries, if they see that there is no 
way we can stop this program and see a perception again, or have a perception of weakness uh, on the part of the United States in responding, will go down the nuclear path. And I think that's uh, uh, another aspect of this that uh, we need to seriously think about because uh, there's no doubt in my mind that without a strong uh, new, uh, security presence by the West, not just the United States, but also uh, NATO, uh, a strong security commitment to the region to counterbalance uh, any uh, activity by Iran <coughs> after or when we think they do have a bomb would be disastrous, would absolutely be disastrous. And that cascade of other nations acquiring these weapons, I think, would, would definitely um, uh, definitely occur. Uh, so one of the things that, I, that, w that NATO needs to do at this point is to uh, think through what we would do if Iran actually has a nuclear weapon. And one of our biggest concerns, of course, is Turkey. Um, the U.S. presence in Turkey, I think, is vital if we're going to have any chance of stopping uh, the Turks from going down a path of acquiring nuclear weapons. Uh, and that, that's certainly something that uh, uh, last year at a conference we had on WMD terrorism, at the, uh, we, we discussed this issue we, and we talked about the, the, that potential and, and that's certainly something that, uh, that we remain uh, uh, very worrisome. Second, uh, as I said before, NATO needs to consider how to control uh, further proliferation, and I think that's uh, what, what can we do to prevent a nuclear arms race. And one of those ideas, of course, is to engage actively in, in developing this idea of a nuclear weapon-free zone in the Middle East, which again, isn't going to happen in my lifetime, but it's a process, uh, as I said earlier, by which we, we can try to contain and try to develop the mechanisms by which we can uh, go down that path. And I think I'm running out of time here, so let me stop. I'd be happy to talk more about what NATO can do in, the, in our Q&A. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Guy. Uh, in fact, uh, some, some of his uh, thinking uh, about, about this issue uh, was published here, the Partnership for Peace Review, which is a NATO of a journal, and uh, it can be uh, available to you the new strategic uh, concept. Uh, before we uh, turn to the audience for the questions, comments, I would like to, uh, to ask Professor Don Wallace, who is the chairman of the International Law Institute, who is going to make final remarks. But if you have any comments now or questions before we turn it to, to the audience. I say anything now, but no final remarks. <laughs> Thank you, and I'll, I'll, I'll reserve. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I would appreciate if you kindly identify yourself for the record. Russell. You. You're not going to use the mic? Okay. Um, Is that never mind. I, no. okay. I didn't know which procedure was going to be. I'm Edward Marks, retired State Department. Uh, this is an extraordinarily rich and detailed discussion, but nevertheless, I find it somewhat unidimensional. Uh, Henry Kissinger, blessed be his name, <laughs> once defined international politics and diplomacy as the art process of convincing someone of the virtues of going this way and the costs of going the other way. And this is all been a conversation about the second part. Now, shouldn't a more comprehensive full program include attempts at political negotiation, even if we, we rebuffed originally, and a political diplomacy. Now, before anybody accuses me of State Department naivete, I'm not talking about this approach replacing any of the processes you're talking about, but adding to it. In other words, shouldn't a comprehensive approach is from both the prevention and in dealing with it, through the deterrence, et cetera, include a very active, continuous political negotiation diplomatic element? I think the, the view of the administration <clears throat> is that they tried, you know, the two-track approach, <coughs> reached out to uh, Iran and were rebuffed. Uh, there were other initiatives, such as the, the swap of the partially enriched fuel to the Tehran research reactor, which Ahmadinejad tried to close the deal, it seems, and then he was rebuffed domestically. So I think that the, the view now is that we need to go to the next phase of softening up the Iranians a bit more and getting them to be more um, ready to bargain. Uh, so I don't think this is being uh, forgotten about. I think we're just in a different phase of the 
negotiating process where the pressure is the leading edge and negotiations are always available if, if, if the opportunity arises. Yeah, I, yeah I'll be no, I would just <clears throat> endorse what Sandy said. I, you know, I mean, I, I agree, and uh, that that has to be the end game. And, and there are on the table the offers made by the you know uh, P5 you know previously, yeah. which I think are have never been withdrawn. So I mean, there is a basis uh, you know on, on what to to talk about. So and that's ultimately the end game because I think our, our interests are better served by a diplomatic a successful diplomatic process than a. Uh, uh, you know, a slide uh, in, you know, toward war or, or intensified conflict. Because I think that in the end, in the short run, you know, that, that serves the regime in Tehran uh, better than it serves our interests or the interests of us and our allies. So. I, I just want to follow up on that. I don't think that the problem is, and, and it was interesting, the process with the EU versus the EU3, is, it, and, and it was also like in a bit to what we are dealing with North Korea, is that, you know, so far, no matter how terrible their actions are, no matter what they say, we keep offering them good things. And, and it's almost like, you know, the Marine Corps has saying, you know, we're, uh, you have no better friend but no worse enemy. And they need to understand that if they, if they go down this path of complying with UN sanctions, of you know, giving up this program, there are great rewards and benefits to be had in that. Way. But if you go down this other path, there's gonna be tremendous costs. And they haven't quite got it through their head yet that there are these tremendous costs. And that's, the hard power needs to go with the soft power. It was actually our position uh, going back to after the initial Natanz revolution of 2002. It was our, and many other countries approached the Iranians uh, in those early years of this crisis uh, that if they are, if, if, if what they really want is a nuclear power generation capability, the surest route to a world class, first rate, very effective and economically beneficial uh, nuclear power generation program was in fact to say yes to all these international proposals, accept international assistance, which was indeed on the offing, um, and, to, uh, you know, and to sort of proceed down that route. It simply required forswearing the capability to do all this stuff for weapons purposes on their own. Um, and, and I think in this respect, all, all, all those efforts have indeed, as, as my colleagues have been saying, been rejected. But I should also point out that I think there is utility in setting a, a baseline of cost uh, in the sense that there is always lurking in, in, you know, in these kinds of policy questions that there's a moral hazard challenge. And we see this a lot with the North Koreans. Um, to what extent is a negotiating posture one which is, in a sense, concessionary in such a way as to reward bad behavior? Or to what extent is it one that is, in fact, necessary to induce good behavior? You've got to, you know, these are, this is a, there's no bright line answer to what the, the, the challenge is. But I think the Libyan case shows an interesting interesting uh, comparison here, in the sense that in the Libyan case, what was in effect offered in 2003-2004 to the Libyans uh, by the United States and the UK, and, and by implication the rest of the international community, was in fact not benefits, you know, not rewards for having done the wrong thing, and sort of you know, creating a market for non-proliferation violations, um, but in fact a return to normality. Uh, and, you know, and Libya was in a position by 2003 in which it, it faced considerable pressures on all fronts for all kinds of reasons, mostly related to terrorism, but not exclusively, um, and feared that it faced potentially even more dramatic ones as of March 2003, when its, its diplomats first made overtures to the, uh, to the British Secret Intelligence Service. So in a sense, by creating a baseline of cost, then one was able to negotiate about a return to normal relations with the rest of the world, which could be, especially in that kind of, would seem enormously beneficial. Um, in ways that didn't present moral hazard problems because it, what was not contemplated was giving Libya anything beyond what it would have gotten had it been a respectable member of the international community during the interim. So, so I think actually it's very useful to set a baseline of cost. Um, as of 2003, additional benefits of the sort that were offered appear not to be particularly interesting to Iran in comparison to what it felt like we apparently to get out of the weapons program. Um, you know, maybe we can change that calculation. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, Milton uh, thank you very much for your uh, enlightening conversation. I think that my question to you is um, sort of moving away from fanning the flames of war. I would like to say, should we, you know, implement diplomatic means and actually get to the point of trying to uh, implement a grand bargain with Iran of some sort? What concessions might we make to Iran uh, as far as the nuclear program is concerned? Is it, for instance, possible to allow them to continue 
enriching 3.5% uranium in one or two emission plants, or is that out of the question? What, what could we offer them in the nuclear area if such a uh, negotiation actually took place? I suppose one could offer all kinds of things. I guess the question, to some extent, hinges on what one believes their objective really is. And I suppose my comments earlier, where we have, in fact, been offering them, not necessarily their own, certainly not their own in situ enrichment, but we have been offering them, a, 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 frankly, much, probably much more effective access to nuclear power generation. And if the objective is to generate power and to have a sophisticated domestic nuclear industry, that has been available for some time. If their objective is to have the technological wherewithal to break out, um, I guess your question would be, you know, can, could we be satisfied with giving them the capability to break out more slowly than they are currently able to break out? And I suppose if you posit that the alternative is quicker versus slower, slower is better than quicker, but I'm not sure that's a, that, that's not a very effective negotiating, I mean, that, 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 that amounts to not a grand bargain, but yet another kicking of the can down the road. Which, and there may be virtues in delay. You know, delay is better than immediate problems in many cases. But, but I don't think that represents a grand bargain as solution. That represents a grand bargain, so called, as temporization. Can I just add the yeah, point? Because I, I just wanted to address the uh, the comment about fan and the thing wins of war. I mean, you know, I I, I think the, the the paradox of the situation we're in right now is that um, if, if we don't do anything in terms of strengthening. Um, uh, the credibility of, of our military instrument and national power, we might actually find ourselves in that situation eventually. So, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I, I think part of the problem is that we really kind of forgot some of the lessons of, of, of returns from the Cold War. And the problem is even if you are an advocate of, you know, the game's over and we should reconcile ourselves to uh, the idea of a nuclear run and let's get into the uh, contain and, you know, deter mode, well, if you want to effectively contain and deter them, they have, you have to have an... Uh, there has to be a credible threat of, of the use of, milita of the military instrument if they cross, whether it's red lines or however you want to frame it, that even that has to be part of a, of a viable contain and deter policy. Anyhow, so no matter which way you go forward, whether you're you know, contain and, con con and deter person and the game's over, or whether you're saying, no, we still, we still can change their, their calculus, their risk calculus, and prevent them from breaking out, either way you have to have the military instrument has to figure into this and it has to be credible, and that's not fanning, that's not fanning the flames of war, that's, that's protecting the peace, from my point of view. So. Okay. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm uh, Tony Senate uh, Marine, formerly known as the guy from the Potomac Institute, but at any rate, uh, looking, at, uh, looking at trying to define red lines, okay, let's assume that, that national policy defines red lines, are you saying that it must be a direct kinetic action that's threatened by the United States, or is it reasonable to look to a partner nation? And if so, what nation would you look to? I'm going to follow up to that. Okay, I mean, is it Israel? Is it Saudi Arabia? Is it Turkey? Is it Afghanistan? Um, for instance, with regard to virtues, it seems to me the consensus is we don't know what they would want. But uh, but with regard to the uh, what's happened with the Arab Spring, are they vulnerable to internal pressures? And is there an avenue of approach there that would be useful? Well, I guess I was arguing just to go to the last issue. Uh, we're waiting on this. Is there's a domino effect here, and it's almost a little, I mean, not literal, but it's, it's one you can sort of observe without a whole lot of trouble. Uh, it's Libya, Syria, Iran, I and mean, that would be the, the, the way this is moving. Uh, it may be that there won't be military intervention in Iran when the time comes, but the sort of uh, groundswell of international opprobrium for uh, violent suppression of opposition groups, I mean, that is building and building. And even in uh, Syria, where we can't get uh, UN support for uh, military involvement, you know, the head of the Human Rights Commission in the UN uh, called for, quote, intervention, at least diplomatic, if not military, uh, last week. And the more this goes on, 
And then when we see Assad fall, I mean, the more the, the hands of the Iranian government is going to be tied as it attempts to uh, deal with what is unlike, you know, certainly will be some form of uprising within Iran. That, I mean, that's how I view. Now, the uprising may not be completely spontaneous. It may be encouraged. But I don't think this is going to be a stable situation six months from now in, in Iran proper. Yeah, if, if I could uh, quickly see Tony also. Just, um, with regard to red lines, you know, there was uh, an episode, I think it was after the uh, North Korean bomb test in 2006, where um, I think uh, National Security Advisor Stephen Hadley was asked, you know, are we going to kind of draw the red lines in, in, in the wake of this um, in order to, you know, you know, indicate to them that they can't test again or transfer, you know, the technology elsewhere. And he said, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna define red lines because they keep walking up to it and then stepping over. And so, you know, I, I'll be honest with you. You know, the, the thing is, you know, I don't know whether the best approach is a degree of ambiguity or a degree of clarity and specificity with regard to red lines. Personally, I, I don't, I haven't thought about this enough to know exactly how you operationalize this. Um, the Iranians are very good at circumventing red lines um, through incrementalism and, and proxies and, and um, you know ambiguity, the policy of ambiguity, um, which may not be for the for, at least for now may not be an option for them if if, the, if we you know if the program has been somewhat penetrated. Um, so to be honest with you, I don't have the answer to you. But in, in terms of who needs to do it, look, I mean, part of what we need to be doing now is socializing the Iranians so that if in the in the end of the day we do revert to a policy of Deterring and containing a nuclear Iran, because in the end they do get the weapons. We have to lay the foundations now, and, and it's basically it's us. As as long as we are, you know, and this is a decision for the American people, and what role the United States, you know, will you know will continue to play in the world. And if we want to continue to see ourselves as as being the, the keeper of the balance in the Gulf, there's no substitute for contracting out this responsibility to someone else. So if if we are looking at eventually, you know, as a fallback option deterring and containing a nuclear Iran, we have to start now laying the foundation. And we are. We are doing that in many ways. But with regard to red lines and, and, and you know, establishing the credibility of our of, 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 the, of the American military uh, instrument, we have to start now. And again, I, I don't know whether, again, to what degree clarity or ambiguity serves our purposes there, but there's no substitute for us playing that role if we see ourselves as a keeper of a containment regime in the Gulf. I remember sitting in the uh, IEA Board of Governors meeting in early 2003 and hearing the British ambassador to the IAEA talking about how this was Iran's last chance yeah. to come clean or we were sent to the Security Council with terrible things with us too. <coughs> Be careful with red lines unless you mean them. Um, we have sent some bad messages to the North Koreans. Oh, if they proliferate anything to do with their uh, nuclear material or technology, that, that's a red line for us. Oh, uh, Libya, you have said? Well, uh, well, we're not sure about that. Um, oh, the Syrian reactor? Well, it's gone now, so it doesn't really matter. You know, I mean, one has to be very cautious in setting them. Uh, and I share, to some extent, you have this nervousness about it, because you really do have to mean it. On the other hand, if you do issue one, you should be prepared for the message that you will send by not enforcing. Okay, Mike. Yeah, uh, Minecraft on the State Department commentary is I was probably directed Mike and kept using the word weaponize. And I, you know, regarding his military background, but one of the things that always concerned us was the sort of dirty bomb or scenario with radioactive that enhanced material, the Kleinstein truck bomb or a dirty or you know, an old tanker ship. What do you think of the prospects of that being more likely? And kind of related this in terms of the guy, uh, is there any concept in NATO that, that even if they don't believe that Iran would use a nuclear weapon to work on Israel, but they might use it to intimidate the Saudis and others to raise oil prices, and that the, the nuclear capability would give them a deterrent threat against, for retaliation, against retaliation by the U.S. and the Gulf countries. I mean, that, I, you see that as a potential scenario or you know, option for them. And then finally, how, how serious do you think the European countries are, for example, until recently, at least with Tonsa was still maintaining the Iranian air involved in, in uh, translating our flights to Europe, etc. It was always been holes in the sanctions. China, we haven't mentioned that China or Russia is rolling with you, too. How do we put more pressure on them? Yeah. And, and the, uh, the dirty, you know, dirty um, um, uh, uh, you know, weapon. 
I, you know, I, I again, I, I defer to uh, other, I've, you know, read reports like a lot of us have done. And my understanding is, well, first of all, um, Iran, you know, can probably get what they need from any number of hospitals in the country. You know, not from their nuclear program necessarily. Although there is a connection, they are apparently producing mental isotopes, you know, uh, you know um, in the program for their hospitals. Is in Lebanon? Probably, you know, runs clinics and stuff, and they, you know, for all I know, they might have, you know, medical isotopes there that could be useful for a dirty bomb. So the thing is, I, I think the, the threat of the dirty bomb is, is kind of exaggerated because the studies I've seen done basically indicate that unless you in ingest the, uh, you know, radioactive material into your system, I mean, if you get in your clothes, you know, you shower, you know, shower, decon, um, you know, in, in, you know, I think throw away your clothes and shower, you're okay, as long as it's not lodged in your body. And that, that's only likely to happen if you're in the immediate area um, during the, the release. And then you've got the cleanup. Now, it's a psychological problem, because first of all, it's, it's, it's an insidious, invisible weapon that, you know, uh, it's radiation, and there's all kinds of, you know, uh, fears, uh, you know, relating on that. And, no, and in the day and age we live in, I'm not sure that would believe the government that it's safe to open businesses or for a normal life to return to an area where there was a really radiological incident. So you have there's all kinds of long-term, you know, insurance issues and, and and the like. So I think it's more a psychological weapon, and I, I just have tended. I'm not sure. I don't see the Iranians going that route. You know, you have, you have to be ready for the possibility. But um, I, I think you know they've done very well with conventional explosives. You know, uh, through their proxies, and and now using a, Iran, uh, the nuclear program as a psychological warfare weapon. Um, you know, and I, I don't see them going down that that particular route. But you never know. Uh, but it, it's it's more a psychological uh, what, warfare weapon, uh, radiological uh, part of the terrorism, and part of the terrorism program, not as a as a national policy, an overt national policy. But yeah. on on you know, I, it, there is certainly very real concern within NATO about Iran Iran going to the uh, and and exactly the point you made, Mike, about you know the idea is that they would they're acquiring a nuclear capability not to affect explode a nuclear weapon, but as part of their deterrent strategy to keep NATO and the United States marginalized or out of the out of the Gulf so they can pursue their hegemonic aspirations. So you've got this now and now the, the, the real counter here is number one to assure Turkey uh, that you know that the United States uh, uh, will continue to provide for their security. Number two is to is to assure uh, the Saudis and other nations in the, in the Gulf, um, and 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 reaffirm the relationship with Israel. That any uh, attempt to blackmail, any attempt to cajole or do any of the other things that a nuclear armed Iran would try to do would be, in fact, uh, resisted, would would be countered, and that there would be this very strong aggressive uh, policy. You remember that. Um, during the uh, tanker wars, you know, it, you know, I mean, we were, we had an aggressive policy, and the Iranians were, you know, were intimidated. But they haven't forgot that lesson either. And, and so now we're in this game about how they can re-challenge, or specifically in the Gulf, and and what they can do to dominate that region, and then and do some things. In fact, I saw an article today. I think they threatened to, you know, if you try anything, the price of oil is going to two hundred fifty dollars a barrel. Mm -hmm. And and of course, that's the that's the ultimate threat. I mean. I think all of us would agree that look at it, that we could present Russia Russia would actually support war then yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they might. They would because that would be a good thing for them. Two hundred fifty dollars a barrel would make the Russians very rich. Yes. Can I, uh, no, I'm just gonna say that um, that uh, you know, that's not like, yeah, the uh, Chinese. Well, okay. I'll, if I'll, if I'll, I could just jump in very very quick point. <laughs> you, and, and this is again, um, you know, I I'm all in favor in doing everything we can to increase the pressure on Iran. But this is one of the dangers. If we are, find ourselves in a situation where we do things, and it, it doesn't seem we're going to get there, but that we are do, do things which end up um, limiting or, or ending up in Tehran's ability to export oil, they've always made a connection be between um, freedom of navigation in the Gulf and their ability to export oil. And they've always said, if we can't export oil, nobody can export oil. So we want to avoid getting ourselves in a situation where we put them where they have nothing to lose by obstructing the freedom of navigation in the Gulf. We don't want to go there. So we've got to be very careful, even while doing everything we can to ratchet up pressures, not do things that, you know, uh, kind of, uh, you, know, you know, cross a, a red, one of their red lines that brings us to a next level that we don't want to get to. You know, I mean, they don't even have to. For example, one of the scenarios we, that we seem postulated is that they would announce to the world they planted a nuclear device and a ship that they sunk in the, in the Straits of Hormuz, 
without detonations, well, you can imagine how much Lloyd's of London would charge. Uh, and you know what the price of oil would be there, but uh, but again, they'd be shooting themselves in the foot. I mean, we've also looked at scenarios where if you blockade the Gulf in six weeks, they'd be on their knees. And if you really truly wonder, as long as you're willing to pay five dollars a gallon for gasoline, sanctions can work, <laughs> but they have to really be real sanctions. But I could just just really quickly emphasize the point, the distinction that Guy made, and that, that your question implied as well, between the. Um, the Direct use concerns and the what happens to with a nuclear empowered Iran. And Iran. So I, mean, I, I, I share the view that I think the principal interest isn't actually in war fighting with nuclear weapons. I think it is in uh, empowering them and, and ensuring you know, the insurance policy against um, outside intervention that might keep them from doing the things that they want to do in the region. And that's an important distinction because if you think all the, the game is just about deterring direct use, then you get into these discourses well, what would it take, in fact, to deter? that and could we live with a nuclear armed Iran because gosh it would be suicidal for them to actually use one of these things therefore these things will that weapons and weaponry will sort of sort of cancel each other out. Um, I think the principal concern isn't I agree the principal concern isn't that but what Iran would do if it felt immunized in a sense against outside involvement. And given how badly Iran has behaved over the last couple of decades, three, three decades, in the Gulf without <coughs> nuclear weapons, I think the idea of a, of giving them that kind of an insurance policy self perceived, whether it's accurate or not. Uh, would be a very, very dangerous thing. And that's probably where the principal regional concerns come in. Okay, uh, in the back, please. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Chris Bidwell. Uh, question, we've heard a lot about tools we can use to pressure Iran. We've heard about you know, economic isolation sanctions, sanctions against transfers of WD materials. We've heard about overt action, covert action, war, red lines. But my question goes to what end? What, do you, what, what are these policies designed to get Iran to do. It becomes a very important question because uh, I've been traveling around and, and listening to a lot of Iranians lately, unfortunately, maybe unfortunately. But uh, the big thing is uh, their, their feeling was, oh, this is all about regime change. And I thought, well, do we want regime change or is the policy to look for behavior change, i.e., stop doing terrorist, uh, supporting terrorists, or stop proliferation acts? And if your objective is different, I, I think that the, the amount of the effectiveness of the tools might differ depending on which goal you're going after, regime change or simply behavior change. Uh, and if our, our goal is simply behavior change, not going down the new, what are some ways you can articulate that? What are the ways you can get that message across? Uh, so I hope that question is clear. Without the, uh, yeah, thank you. I think we're on shifting sands in that respect, frankly, at this point. Like all along, you know, until probably comparatively recently, it's been pretty clear that, at least from a U.S. perspective, the objective is not regime change, but a change of regime mind, um, you know, getting it to change its mind about its policy. Uh, and that's a critical distinction, I would imagine, from the Iranian perspective, with, except that, A, they didn't believe it even then, um, and B, it may not necessarily be true now. And there's a problem with that kind of approach, and that the longer that one uh, spends, the longer that the, the target of such pressure is spent, rejecting every effort to get them to do the right thing, every inducement, and indeed shrugging off at all sorts of whatever pressures have been applied. Um, and the more that they demonstrate that, that outsiders' concerns about how they are behaving and how they would behave um, are to some extent justified. And the closer they come to acquiring the technical wherewithal to break out at will on short notice from the non-proliferation regime, the more they are creating circumstances in which it is harder for outsiders to contemplate merely a regime change of mind. So I fear that the Iranians may be in fact creating circumstances in which regime change becomes not merely an option, but indeed a very compelling one for those in the outside world. But we're not necessarily there yet, but, but this is not impossible. If, if I could just also just reframe the issue just a little bit, uh, Chris, I, I, I mean, look, if you ultimately take the Islamic Republic you know, on its own terms, Ultimately, they would like to export the revolution, and eventually the Mahdi's going to come, and there'll be a universal world government under the Mahdi. They have their vision of, you know, the future, and that necess won't necessarily stop them from negotiating with us, um, you know, if, if it's in their interest to do so. And likewise, our aspiration for potentially, perhaps, I think, for to see a, a different government there, and a better government there, won't necessarily stop us if we feel there's a, a good deal to be made that promotes our interests. Okay, so I don't think you know the you know the the the, 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 the secret desires of both sides. And I think look, I, I think we've been somewhat in the United States, um, somewhat um, um, you know, two minds uh, on this one. 
Um, you know, it, clearly the previous administration was, you know, committed, you know, more, more um, aggressively, at least at an earlier stage, committed to regime change than it was later on. But, um, you know, I, and we might eventually be heading in this direction with this, this administration. But again, if there's a deal to be had that serves both sides' short-term interests, I think, you know, that, that shouldn't stop us, and I think it wouldn't stop us. Uh, I, I just think that they are committed, you know, to, um, you know, acquiring, um, you know, these kind of means, um, the, the ability to produce nuclear weapons, um, um, and that's something, you know, keep in mind, you know, Zia Al-Haq used, Al used to say in Pakistan that um, if they had to eat, you know, mud or grass, you know, they would do so in order to get the bomb. And I, I think, really, that's the mindset of, of the regime in Tehran uh, in this regard. But again, <coughs> You know, the, the, diplomacy is the art of the possible. And, and an assessment should never stop you from exploring possibilities. And, and we should be doing that while ratcheting up the pressure, so. If I could just comment yeah. on this. I mean, if you look at the sanctions, and this is a chart you can't see from the audience. This is at the back of the um, <coughs> testimony of David Cohn, December 1st before the Foreign Relations Committee. And it shows the gap between the official value of the, of the Iranian real and the um, and the market value, and the market value is going down, 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 largely because of sanctions. These are not nuclear-directed sanctions. These are regime sanctions. And I think, I think what we're seeing is a shift from um, uh, sort of using these broader sanctions, lightly applied, to get uh, a change in the nuclear issue to the reverse using the nuclear issue to rally international support for stronger and stronger sanctions that are going to try to impact the longevity of the regime. And so I think this shift has, is, is unfolding. And I think, and as I say, I was citing the Syrian case, I, mean, I think this is the, the direction of the events. But if you take it far enough and we put enough pressure on, we did have good negotiations in 2003. That's, you know, unfortunately when we invaded Iraq, but there was a point at which the pressure was so strong on Iran that they, they, they blinked. And I guess we're at a stage when we don't want to do it quite that way again. I mean, by you know, overt military threats, but by other means to see if we can maybe reach that same stage of, 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 of change. And I guess nobody would be dissatisfied with a Libyan-like um, outcome, the 2003, you know, where they have a couple of uh, secret uh, chemical munitions stashed away someplace. I mean, we would. I think settle for that package. Yes. Dan Pollock from the Zionist Organization of America. Uh, as I understand it, uh, the Iranians take the term Persian Gulf quite literally. And they, they tend to view some of those islands as rightfully theirs. Given all the talk we've had about avoiding war, the talk of the hotline that we would put in to avoid misunderstandings, and the fact that we haven't reacted even under the provocation of the continued nuclear program, what exactly would the United States or NATO do if the Iranians should seize a small island, not of great strategic significance to the United States? And are we really prepared for that option? Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I certainly think that as a matter of policy, any aggression where someone's going to take uh, territory just like, of course, Iraq did with Kuwait, should have been met immediately with a very you know, overwhelming and, and uh, responsive force. Um, now, you know, we had those kind of forces back in the 80s in which any kind of action like that was met, whether it was trying to take an oil platform in the Gulf, which, again, they could possibly do. And again, to, to allow that to happen would be, I think, catastrophic. It would be absolutely catastrophic. So you would hope that the U.S. policy and this is the other reason I mentioned uh, on this trip I, I took last year is, you know, any, any connection with NATO was warmly embraced by the uh, Kuwaitis, uh, uh, our Istanbul Cooperation Initiative country, Peter, <coughs> UAE, uh, and, and they're looking for those kinds of involvements to ratchet, uh, certainly to, to acknowledge the fact that if there was any kind of activity like that, they, there would be allies of these small nations because they're very, very afraid of Iran. I mean, that, that was my impression when I was there. Uh, any of our colleagues don't? Yes. Just several people have mentioned in Hezbollah, the great surrogate for Iran in a number of areas. Without bringing up its Western Hemisphere activities, 
particularly in the tri-border area in South America. The fact that that's a source of funding for activities. The money they raise in the United States, again, to support their activities in the Middle East mainly. And it seems to me that unilaterally and also multilaterally, we could mount a bigger attack on Hezbollah uh, in our hemisphere than has been the case. And it, it would be a, a way of serving notice that would fit within either a law enforcement or counterterrorism construct or both. And, and might send a useful message to Iran in terms of the projection of its capabilities and ideas. And I haven't heard anybody talk about that, but it, it's certainly a course of action that's available to us. And it's not messy. It doesn't take a lot of meetings with a lot of countries to get on with it. It wouldn't just send a message. I think it would also contribute to damage mitigation in the event that things did deteriorate more directly with Iran, because it would limit their capability to pull on Hezbollah's international networks and, and operationalize for terrorism purposes what had hitherto been simply a process of creating ties and networks for financial support and organizational activity. So in a sense it would be part of the damage, it could be part of the damage mitigation strategy as well as a signaling effort. So I, I'm not again. Uh, not either. I think that's exactly what I was, one of the things I was trying to say is that we should counter every effort they make. And I certainly, as we are well aware of how porous our borders are, uh, certainly in the southwest and uh, with, with the transporting of drugs across the border. It's just as easy. And, and of course, as pressure gets ratcheted up and certain incidents occur in the Persian, so-called Persian Gulf, it's not certainly, uh, it's certainly within the realm of the possible that we would see some sort of effort across our borders and to, and to have some sort of activities. And, you know, that would be. And so if we start aggressively uh, pushing back on that, I think that's, that's kind of the message that we want to send. And I, I still find it really incredible that we allow, and Admiral Mullen even mentioned this in his retirement, that you know, we're allowing the Iranians to provide weapons, provide training, <coughs> to have training camps, and to do all these things without any cost whatsoever, as far as I can see. And I think, I think that needs to change. Okay, anyone else on the panel? Uh, if not, Professor Dunbar? Yeah, I'm going to sit here if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, before I thank our <coughs> co-host, yes, my have a but the ingenious title of Yonah, uh, the final warning, and Yonah said, this is the final warning to Iran. I thought the question was, is the final warning to us? Um, and indeed, um, I was a very solid program. I know you to be able to bring it to the college. Um, but I must say, I think lots of questions were asked, and I really don't, I don't think I've heard real answers. Um, one thing I think is interesting, and we shouldn't forget this part of, you know, we should be thinking about the NPT general, I mean, Iran is the current uh, kind of aggressive country, but there'll be others, and I'm not sure I want my great, great, great grandchildren, and I want to have them live in a world where I think many countries have nuclear weapons. So I think that really is the overall. I think both the administrations have been aware of that. Um, I came to Iran, I, I was in Iran before Yona. I was there first in 1963. I was in the And I came away with a new vent in 1963. I think it was rather troubling. Yona spoke about the nuclear ambitions of the Iranians. I think deeper, it's been suggested, is the Overall, this is an extremely ambitious people. They're not particularly modest people, I understand what's Iranian or not. They are not a particularly modest people, and I think regime change won't necessarily change them. This is a very, maybe a question of time, they're very ambitious. They, they've always wanted to be a number one. There's nothing to do with Sassanian in Persian history. This is what they want to do. So I think this is uh, something we have to constantly bear in mind. I, I must say, I'm not a strategist. I'm the idea of coexisting with an Iranian nation that has nuclear weapons, I think, is unacceptable to my opinion. Um, and of course, you know, people talk about deterrence and containment, but that takes you back to, in retrospect, the mystery of the rational uh, It's a much more porous world. I've lived in Turkey, and I'm sure that the Iranians become you know, threatening. 
Incidentally, let me just go back to the Iranian ambition. I think this goes way beyond deterring the United States. I think that is a move. I think the Iranians, and many people, want to deter threats of themselves. But I think this is deeper. And so I think that these gentlemen have a real job to do. To how does one prevent the harm? Um, I wanted to thank Yona, the ever ingenious proposer of questions. <coughs> My name is John the Sony Institute. I noticed that I've been in a lot of these programs, the audience will get larger and larger. There are more members of the Sony Institute board with us. So Yona, you must be doing the right thing. And uh, thank you all very much. Hi. 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 Hi.